Welcome back to renowned physicist, Dr. Jeremy England, former professor of physics at MIT, author of Every Life is on Fire, currently a machine learning researcher in the biotech industry here in Israel. Good evening, Dr. England. Good evening, and Chanukah Sameach. Um, I, I thought uh, this week, because uh, we're in the middle of Chanukah, that it would be interesting to talk about a topic that is connected with Hanukkah, but in another sense, maybe in terms of one of the sources that I'll bring, it's it's more directly connected with Purim. Um, but I think really there's sort of, in this discussion, two sides of the same coin. And one way of introducing the topic is to say, I want to talk a bit about what is called anti-Semitism. Um, but I, I think um, in some sense, the question I'm going to be asking is, is that piece of terminology aligned with how the Torah wants us to view animosity towards Jews? Because obviously we know, you know, there are different definitions you could give to anti-Semitism. I think there's kind of a, there's a narrow definition, uh, or even maybe like a very historically faithful one that would say, uh, the, the term was coined by Wilhelm Marr in 19th century Germany, and that it really reflected uh, an evolution in animosity towards Jews in Europe, because historically, a lot of the violence against Jews and a lot of the persecution of Jews had been driven by religious fervor in Europe, um, by the Catholic Church and things like that. But uh, in the late 19th century, there were a lot of Europeans who regarded themselves as being very enlightened and and uh, very, uh, let's say, educated to move beyond the uh, inclinations that backward religious feeling used to give them. But then there was this problem that many especially in Germany, still found that they had great dislike for Jews and they needed an explanation for that. And so anti-Semitism was initially coined as a term, as a way of, of saying, I'm not against the Jews for backward religious reasons, but rather um, I, I have quite principled, modern, enlightened views on the subject that still lead me to some kind of <clears throat> hostility towards Jews because of their racial qualities. And um, there really are passages in, in, in Mein Kampf, actually, that Hitler, where Hitler essentially makes the same kind of statement about himself and his own attitudes that, you know, he himself always felt it was quite backward to dislike Jews because, you know, your, your priest or pastor or whoever uh, gave you some sermon about it. Um, but that he, he found there were other substantive reasons to um, have the animosity that he did. So that's kind of a, a historical and, and a narrow definition of anti-Semitism. Um, and it, it's it's an interesting one to, to note, but it also kind of um, uh, just adds to the complication of terminology because then that means that we're not talking about anti-Semitism, for example, when we discuss the Crusades and you know instances where, because of uh, policies or, or uh, ideas of the Roman Catholic Church in the medieval period, there was a lot of mass murder of Jews. Let's say, but it wasn't anti-Semitism because it wasn't post Enlightenment, etc. So, people usually, when they're talking about anti-Semitism, they also can use it as more sort of an umbrella where they say. Um, Historically, you know, throughout the ages, there have been many different forms that hostility and you know politics organized violently against the Jews have taken. Um, and we can call all of that anti-Semitism. And it's like a very complex history. And there are things that are always the same, and there are things that are always different, and it mutates and it and it, it it rears its head in different ways. And I think that's usually what people are referring to. Um to some degree, at least, when they um, invoke the idea of anti-Semitism, especially, I would say, when Jews who are proud of their Jewishness and very inclined to protect Jews from those who are hostile to Jews, 
um, when they talk about anti-Semitism, that is what they're referring to. They're referring to the, the, the sort of the oldest hatred version of, of the idea of anti-Semitism. But there's maybe a third version, which is maybe in, in sort of ironic ways connected with the first definition that it maybe has especially a lot of currency now um, in the uh, current era, especially in places like America and Britain, um, or let's say the West and Europe in general, but also you know influencing sectors in Israel as well, which is the idea of anti-Semitism as an example of racist bigotry that happens to apply to Jews, so that you, you sort of are uh, just saying that there are different kinds of racist bigotry, and the one that targets Jews we call anti-Semitism um, for reasons, you know, historical reasons or whatever, um, but it's it's just one of many such examples. And I, I think that it does sometimes get talked about that way, as as we'll see, because um, I, I can return to that subject. But that, that is a separate way of using the term, and it's kind of maybe a more present era way of using the term. Um, but in any case, you know, even talking about all those th three different definitions, um, it's worth making a comment why people feel the need to refer to it as a phenomenon. Um, because nothing in what I said so far really does justice to the fact that there's something when you study a bit about what people who really hate Jews think, um, the, the degree of deluded mania that people can be caught up in, like the, the, the scale of falsity and uh, delusional paranoia that often threads through a lot of the, the beliefs of such people Again, in, in different historical periods, like what people were willing to believe about Jews, however many years, hundreds of years ago in Europe, when there were blood libels, or what people are willing to believe about uh, uh, Jews in Israel today, you know, when uh, different kinds of calumnies and, um, you know, uh, attacks are, are being spun or sown by Israel's enemies uh, throughout the uh, Arab and Muslim world, you know, in places like Iran or or in other hostile states, right? Th there is a common thread there, which is there, there's something kind of uh, horrifying and fascinating about the imagined idea of of Jews. Um, and there's a lot of cross fertilization between things, so that even though European style or Nazi style 20th century anti-Semitism that had all of this stuff to do with banking and newspapers and, you know, global conspiracy, you know, protocols of the elders of the Zion, of, of Zion type stuff that came from Tsarist Russia, that it, it was very easy for that to just become a popular set of ideas to find in Syrian newspapers in the latter half of the 20th century, because, oh, there's already some great material on the Jews. So why don't we just pick that up? Even though the Islamic opposition to the state of Israel or the Baathist opposition to the state of Israel, all these things didn't really, in principle, have any initial idea of Jews as you know, be, being connected with those things. So there's a lot of reason that anti-Semitism deserves its own kind of place as just a phenomenon to be studied. But I think sometimes people with very warm inclination towards Jews, and especially Jews with warm inclination towards Jews, like towards their own people, and who just want to protect Am Yisrael from from uh those who want to do us harm they can be fascinated by anti-semitism as a historical phenomenon and also maybe preoccupied with it as a present day phenomenon in a way that you know it, it deserves to be questioned is this how the torah wants us to understand what it means when people come after the jews um and we obviously have texts that we look to um, when, when trying to understand um, what anti-Semitism is. When we look in our own tradition, there are sources that uh, seem to pick that up. Obviously, the story you know that we read uh, every year on Purim about this attempt to annihilate the Jews reminds us very much of, of the Shoah um, and you know, Haman's attempt to wipe out the Jews. So we think our, we're going to learn a lot about anti-Semitism by looking at Haman. And in one sense, that may be true. 
Um, but I guess before before talking about sources explicitly, I just want to lay down um, kind of a proposal or a, a a provocative question, which is especially in the present era, now that um, we are just at this sort of historical moment when a majority of Jews are starting to be located in the land of Israel um, around the world, uh, uh, a majority of Jews around the world uh, are starting to be located in the land of Israel and where there's this real um, rebirth of sovereignty and the not just the sort of populational center of gravity, but also just the um, the ideological center of gravity of um, Torah and Yadut is, is starting to be quite firmly rooted uh, in Israel and, and having to do with Israel, it, it, it does raise the question uh, whether we find the same use in thinking and talking about anti-Semitism that we may have had in you know, the previous century. And I say this as you know, the grandson of survivors of the Shoah who lost many of their family members to uh, the, the Nazis and uh, Poles who helped them. Um, and uh, I, I, I would never, when talking in those terms, ever wish to suggest somehow that we should be you know, not remembering um, our, our ancestors who who lived under certain conditions and for for whom this was the way of talking about the war against the Jews and 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 um, I, I this isn't about trying to kind of change how we talk about history um, so much as more thinking in the present day and the dynamics of discussion about protecting Jews and and then making sure that. Am Israel is successful in its, you know, national project and all of those things. It does get kind of confused and complicated, and I feel like sometimes it becomes a, a waste of breath or a distraction. And I would argue maybe even also misses the point a little bit in terms of what the Torah wants to teach us about this. To become preoccupied with the question of whether or not certain things are anti-Semitic. Um, so. It's a very common thing you hear, for example, in the present day, like these arguments that happen, especially in places like America, where it's a question of whether an attack on Israel or a criticism of Israel should be considered anti-Semitic or not. And, and the reason that that's an important question is because, in practice, the logic of how this now works somewhere like America is that if you can prove that something is anti-Semitism, then it definitely is bad and everyone is supposed to agree on that because it's a form of bigotry and racism and all forms of bigotry and racism are wrong. And so if we're trying to convince everyone that some kind of hostility or animosity towards the Jews is wrong, then we must first convince them that it originates from some kind of unfounded and implicitly or explicitly racist bigotry. And then we've sort of won the argument and we can get everyone to say like, well, that's not acceptable. Um, and then there's all of this sort of tug of war over, well, this thing that was done to Jews or was done to Israel or was said about Jews or was said about Israel, that is not anti-Semitic and therefore might be more acceptable, whereas this other thing it seems definitely anti-Semitic. And I think especially when well-meaning Jews get pulled into these arguments in the present day, it really seems to me to be often beside the point. And you can make this argument entirely just in kind of common everyday parlance before talking about, you know, making an argument about how, how the Torah might view this, because at the end of the day, um, I certainly am uninterested as now, like a resident of the state of Israel, I'm uninterested if we're talking about violence against Jews here, I'm uninterested in whether that violence originates from what one might call a, an irrational prejudice against Jews, or whether it has some you know, other motivation that in the eyes of some supposedly impartial observer would look to be more sort of noble or, or, or less unfounded. The point is that it's, it's an attack on Israel, it's an attack on our nation, it's an attack on our country. 
And, and you have to view that a certain way. You have to just say, like, look, that if you're attacking us, then you're our enemy and we're going to fight you. Um, and, and so from, this, from the perspective of people in the present day in, in Israel, um, certainly uh, some, the, the sometimes seemingly uh, highly important question when it's being debated sort of in, in, in other places about whether or not something is anti-Semitic or not seems totally irrelevant. Um, uh, so, so you know, you could look at Jeremy Corbyn and um, his uh, political career in the UK. You know, his attempt to be elected prime minister, the Labour Party there, and there was this whole debate about, you know, is the Labour Party being taken over by anti-Semites? And in one sense, it was certainly true the Labour Party is being taken over by anti-Semites because there were a lot of people who hated Israel in the Labour Party who were also willing to engage in all sorts of obviously racist, paranoid delusions about Jews and Israel. And so you could sort of get them dead to rights on um, those transgressions. But but let's imagine a somehow, you know, more disciplined uh, version of the British Labour Party that was just very on point in supporting politics bent on the destruction of the state of Israel, but doing so in this very principled and clear-eyed way that didn't get all caught up in like also making side comments about Jews controlling banks or the media or whatever, they're still the enemy of Am Yisrael if, if that's how they want to operate. Um, and it, it, it doesn't matter whether we call it anti-Semitic or not. And that shows the, the moodness of that discussion in that particular example. And there are other ones like that that you can you know, pull out of you know, recent American politics. Um, and, and so I, I think that what this is pointing to is that there's something kind of upside down. And, and this is where we now want to kind of look at this from the sources a little bit in, in saying that Jews should be concerned about whether hostility directed at them is well-founded or unfounded. Um, or, or, or let's say not well founded or is, is, is irrational or based on some kind of um, prejudice that by some other standard can be ruled unacceptable. Um, and, and rather, we, we should be just talking in terms of, okay, there's different kinds of hostility um, in the world. There's, there's hostility towards Jews, independent of whether they're in Israel or outside of Israel, independent of whether they keep the Torah or don't keep the Torah. There's also hostility towards Israel, um, and there's hostility towards the Torah, which sometimes can come from Jews, um, uh, whether outside of Israel or in Israel. Um, and, and a lot of these different things are, are really swirling in a much more complex ecosystem. Um, and, and the question of which parts of that should be called anti-Semitic and which parts shouldn't may be largely decide the point. So I, I want to kind of put forward um, an alternative framework, which, again, is not meant to say, let's never use the word anti-Semitism again, and let's stop talking about history, because I, I, I think we do need to remember um, the, the generations that came before us and the way the world was experienced by them. You know, And it's also not to say, um, I, I let's not talk about anti-Semitism because we're not concerned about crazy uh, bigots who hate Jews and, and the things they might do. Obviously, there are many people, let's say, in the United States who would be properly classified as anti-Semites, and to the extent that they have hostility towards any kind of Jew of any stripe who are part of our nation, you want them to... Uh, be punished for that, or you want them to be stopped for that, uh, you know, before they do harm, um, you want them to get what's coming to them. And, and that's not um, that's not altered by this discussion. But I'm, I'm not talking kind of about the, the tactical discussion in that, in that sense. I'm talking about the strategic discussion and the, the historical moment that we're in where really a lot is changing about what being a Jew is, and, and that's happening because of the return to the, the land and the birth of the state of Israel and all of these things. And, and I would want to put forward in that light a different framework that is at least 
an alternate way of looking at all of this that is helpful, um, I believe, and that I think is supported by uh, the sources of our tradition. And that is the following. Simple syllogism thing. Uh, <clears throat> Am Yisrael are Mamlechet Konim, a nation of priests. We are Am Hashem, like we're the, the, the people of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that he has chosen to make his covenant with. And so we have been stamped by him in a way that we are branded by him in a way that we can't um, alter. And we carry his banner. We carry his name on us in the world. And that is a straightforward claim of the Torah and of our tradition. Um, and uh, we can accept it in a sense as a, as a, a fact about the self-conception of Am Yisrael at its base, even if any given individual who's a part of the nation is not acting in a way that you know coheres with that agenda or is doesn't regard him or herself as you know uh, being part of that effort, that has always been true about all of Am Yisrael. So that's one thing. Another thing that's true is that all forms of idolatry must in some sense engender in the idolater a hostility towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu, ultimately. And the reason is because their false idol, like what it means to serve a false idol is precisely to uh, elevate to some position of ultimate authority something that is not Hashem, something that is too simple, something that is a sort of um, uh, a more easily grasped idea fashioned by the human intellect or even by human hands if we're talking about an actual statue. Um, and when you, when you subordinate your will to that overly simple thing, when you subordinate your will to, to a false god, um, that automatically puts you at odds with part of HaKadosh Baruch Hu because part of him is not what you've chosen to serve. Part of him is the opposite of that, perhaps. And, you know, you can see this in all sorts of examples, right? That if someone says, I want to make an ultimate uh, deity out of peace, well, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Ishmael Chama, according to the Torah. He's a man of war sometimes, right? He's not always just about peace. If you want to... Um, say that you want to serve war. He's also, you know, Ose Shalom, the one who makes peace, right? Um, and and you can do that with any sort of dyad of opposites that you want. And you can say, like, you don't want to make an idol out of love. You don't want to make an idol out of liberty. Um, even though those, those, those things sound good, um, if you serve liberty to the exclusion of all other things, you're not serving Hashem. And it will put you at odds with the part of Hashem that's not about the absolute supremacy of liberty, for example. Uh, so if we can accept that statement, that, or those two statements, that we are Am Hashem, we carry his name on us, we're, we're, we're the ones who carry his banner in the world, and anything, any ideological system that ultimately is some form of idolatry that is, is not founded properly on service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, according to his liking, something about that ideological system is going to engender animosity towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu at some level. But what is the lightning rod in the world for that animosity, right? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not uh, identifiable with a material object in the world because he, he's not something that can be represented with an idol. Um, the thing in the world that he's most closely identified with other perhaps than, you know, with Yerushalayim and Harabayit, or maybe in conjunction with that, uh, is Am Yisrael. Am Yisrael are his people in the world. Um, and as we say, if we're, if we're carrying his banner, then we're also the lightning rod for animosity towards him. And, and so this is an argument that requires that you accept the assumptions of the what, what the Torah is teaching. And so I understand that, you know, it, it's only going to, in one sense, make sense if um, you're working from sources within the Torah, and we'll, we'll talk about this, some of the sources in a second. But essentially, the argument then is just that um, any society that hasn't 
yet perfected its relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, is going to have some kind of problem with the Jews uh, and that it can't fully stamp out or eliminate. And that doesn't mean it's always as bad, right? Not everywhere is Nazi Germany, not everywhere is the Spanish Inquisition or Soviet Russia or what, you know, all these other places and times um, where things were particularly bad for Jews. Uh, but but it does mean that Am Yisrael, if, if, they're, if we're looking at our situation in diaspora, if we're looking at our situation as Jews in other societies, or if we're looking at our situation as a nation among the nations of the world, surrounded by other nations, if those other nations are not already way ahead of us in their relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know, making that a success and discarding idols and, and, and turning towards him and seek, seeking to serve only him, then something about how that whole society is structured and founded is going to lead one way or another to points of friction, at least, right? Where there's something about Jews trying to do what Jews do and, and representing HaKadosh Baruch Hu and being sort of cantankerous idol smashers and all of that, um, that is going to lead to uh, animosity and hostility and, and maybe sometimes violence. And that doesn't mean it's good. And, and we this isn't an argument for accepting it, like saying, um, well, this is unavoidable. And so we should just stop complaining about it. But it does mean <clears throat> that existentially and sort of strategically Jews who are trying to live and thrive in societies that are not based on the relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that the Torah teaches and that the Torah hopes that the nations of the world, the, 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 the Goyim will also come to, you know, not to keep the Torah like Am Yisrael, but to, to have relationship like Bnei Noach um, to a Kadosh Baruch Hu, there's there, there are going to be things that don't quite fit it. There's going to be an immune reaction against Jews that has one or another origin, and it's going to make um, that thriving imperfect or incomplete. And that doesn't mean Jews shouldn't try to protect other Jews or Jews, Jews should make excuses for violence against Jews or anything like that. But it does mean that Jews who live in those societies and demand in some sense with righteous indignation that the, the world that they inhabit, which is, is being shaped by the ideology of, a, of, a, of, a, of another society, needs to be somehow perfected to the point where there is no... Uh, immune rejection of Am Yisrael, or there's no friction, or there's no difficulty with being a Jew in that society, that is a misplaced notion at some level. It's not, it's not going to happen unless the society discards its idols, which is a very hard thing to get to happen necessarily. So I, I think that that's the, the you know, uh, the point of the main argument I, I want to put forward. And I just, I'll say, you know, briefly that I think this is really something we get from sources in our tradition. So what are the two places, maybe top two places in Tanakh where you could say we get like a study in what you would call anti-Semitism uh, viewed through the, the, the Torah's view on um, what you call the history of Am Yisrael. So one of them is clearly in Megillat Esther, where you have the Jews living in the Persian Empire and uh, this antagonistic uh, competition with Haman, who has decided he wants to destroy the Jews, and the Jews have to fight back first, and all the things that happen there. So I'll just quote one, one source briefly, which is in um, Chazal commenting on Megillat Esther. So this is Esther Rabbah in a, in a Midrash um, that I think almost directly makes the point we were just discussing uh, in saying that so in this moment where Mordechai refuses to bow to Haman, and that provokes Haman against him, uh, what it says about um, Haman is the king commanded, this is Esther Rabbah 
Um, it says, after these matters, King Hasverosh promoted the man's son of Hamedata and he raised him up. That's the Pasuk um, in Esther that's being quoted. The king commanded that they should bow and prostrate themselves to him. What did Haman do? He crafted for himself an embroidered image on his garment and on his heart, and anyone who would prostrate himself to Haman would prostrate himself to the image. So this is Chazal saying, I think in their homiletic way, more or less the same point I was just making, that Haman is representing the authority of the king of the society, uh, and the king is saying, bow to Haman, because Haman is my regent, and you know he's getting the job done out in the land, and, and everyone needs to bow to him to respect the authority of the king. So the king represents the you know ideological system, and then Haman is his sort of um, uh, right-hand man who's going around and, and implementing things. But he's wearing an idol around his neck, so to speak. So you can't bow to Haman without bowing to an idol. Um, and Jews of all kinds, even ones who sometimes have great hostility towards Jewishness or the Torah, you know, and, and only have retained a part of their um, uh, distinctly Judaic identity, even in those instances, especially, you know, in the history of the West, they have very often retained their cantankerous inclination towards idol smashing, right? Like not wanting to bow to at least some of the idols <laughs> that are on offer, um, though they may often sometimes pick other ones. Uh, but uh, th there is something very deep that we have in us as a nation from Avraham Avinu about being willing to, to sort of say the emperor has no clothes and say, no, oh, look, like everyone else is bowing down to this thing, but that doesn't actually make sense. And it's it's an idol and it's it's false and it leads down a crooked path and here's why. So this is something that uh, all sorts of members of Am Yisrael have been willing to say in all sorts of contexts throughout um, the history of our people. Um, and it's to our credit, but it, it provokes animosity, right? And, and so what Chazal is just saying is that it wasn't just a personal uh, sort of uh, contention between uh, Mordechai and Haman that we're talking about here, but that bowing to Haman was about submitting to the idols of the society. And at least some of the Jews in any society where they're living are not going to want to do that because they are Jews, because they they, they have in them that they're on Hashem, they're bearing the banner of Hashem, they're bearing his name in the world, and they can't bring themselves to prostrate themselves before a false idol, at least for, before some false idols as a result. And then that triggers the, the immune reaction, that triggers the response, because now Haman is... You know, uh, furious and and wants not just to get rid of Mordechai, but to get rid of all the Jews. That's explicit in the text. Um, so that is a, a study in the mechanism of what we sometimes call anti-Semitism, but where the focus is on the fact that the society in which this is happening is an idolatrous one, which will be the general case. And that as long as that society has false idols, there will be Jews who won't want to bow to them, and there will be people who will hate the Jews as a general group for the refusal of some of them to go along with the program. So that is the, the repeated mechanism that you can now go around Jewish history and see a lot of different things that look like that if you try to apply that model to it. Um, but we're getting this from Miguel Atester, which is a later source, and, and from Chazal here. I think that the other source that we, we often look at um, in the Chumash itself, if you're going to look for a point in Chumash where you think the study is, is of something you might call anti-Semitism, it's probably going to be about Bnei Israel in Mitzrayim, right? Because that's where we are, a, we are strangers in a strange land. We're a whole nation that's uh, in the land of another nation, and there's hostility and persecution and oppression as a result. Um, and, and the main thing I'll, I'll just focus on there uh, is this issue of um, sheep. Uh, because when B'nai Israel first arrive in Mitzrayim, it's recorded that they have to be kept separate from the Mitzrayim and Yosef eats with them alone because they're shepherds and it's a, it's an abomination to the Egyptians to eat with shepherds. And when they come down to live, they have to go to Goshen because you have to keep its own, you have to keep shepherds separate. 
there's something about not mixing with shepherds that's deeply ingrained in the Mitzri society. And, and exactly why that is and what it amounts to, it doesn't really become clear until centuries later when we're talking, you know, when we're listening to Moshe talking to Pharaoh oh, and saying, we want to serve our God. And to do that, we have to slaughter sheep. But if we do that, then the people here in Mitzrayim will stone us because the sheep is sacred to them in this way where the way we need to deal with sheep, which involves slaughtering them, is so forbidden to them that they will go nuts and, and start attacking us. Um, and the point is not that we're an uh, inescapably shepherding people who always have to sort of bring sheep wherever we go, and sheep always are such an issue. I think you have to kind of abstract and generalize about this a bit and, and say what the Torah is showing us is that there is something about some aspect of either, let's say, maintaining Jewish identity or religious observance, like service of Hashem, according to the Torah, that is always going to run up against some taboo of, of any given society. And it's not always necessarily going to be the same thing. So in Mitzrayim, in this kind of archetypal instance, it was the sheep um, and, and being a shepherd and, and slaughtering sheep and all of that. Um, and that is emblematic because obviously slaughtering sheep is the, the core mitzvah of the Torah in one sense, according to Chazal. Um, it's very hard to pick one mitzvah and say it, it matters most. And there's a, a very lovely Gemara where there's a debate about this that ends on the, the Olat Tamid, which is the daily, twice daily sacrifice of sheep. But it, it needs the whole other passage because of all the other alternatives that seem more plausible in some sense. Um, but the point is that the the daily the, the twice daily sacrifice of sheep in the temple is the sort of heartbeat of the national and religious life of Amisrael in the land as designed by the Torah. Uh, and that activity, Dafka is the thing in Mitzrayim that is going to produce the immune reaction. And so in the Chumash itself, we're seeing the same kind of mechanism where it is about defiling the idols of the Egyptians, right? Their taboos have to do with their idols where they have somehow deified or anti-deified sheep in, in whatever way they're doing. Um, and the Torah is requiring of us that we do something that uh, transgresses their religious boundaries in some sense and provokes the violent reaction. Uh, and that is, uh, if you want to, uh, a way of understanding what you could call antisemitism throughout the ages. But I think the point I'm, I'm trying to pull out of these sources is to try to step away a bit from different ways we've often used the term antisemitism uh, precisely to, to point out instead that we there is value in also looking at this through the lens of how the Torah sees it and just saying, whatever society you're talking about, if that society has false gods, if it is based on different kinds of idolatry, which in general is true of all societies in the world, um, and can be true also, by the way, of a Jewish society um, even in the land of Israel itself, which ties us back to Hanukkah, right? Hanukkah is about a period where Jewish society in the land of Israel had adopted the false gods of the Greeks. Um, and so therefore also trying to keep the Torah produced an immune reaction. And that led to a very complicated and protracted battle between Hellenized Jews and those who wanted to insist on the Torah. <laughs> but the point is, in whatever society you're talking about, insisting on uh, seeking the relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that he desires from his people uh, for one reason or another will always produce some kind of reaction against Am Yisrael. And that doesn't always mean that we can't fit or we can't thrive or we can't survive somewhere. But it does mean that it is 
futile and misplaced to speak in idealistic terms that, that imagine that somehow there may come a day where here in this still idolatrous society, uh, that it will be a perfectly accepting and safe place for Jews. And I think especially, you know, America is, is a place where it sounds like the, the idealism on which America is based should be able to provide that and has come, you know, uh, closer to that than perhaps any other society in history of being a non-Jewish society that's based on ideals that makes it possible for Jews to be quite safe and quite successful there. Uh, and, and that probably is, is in large part due to the fact that America is also, of any society in the world, perhaps the closest uh, to aligning its values with the values of the Torah, um, if we're talking about societies designed and, and built by Gentiles. Um, but at the end of the day, it isn't a society that has perfected its relationship to a Kadosh Baruch Hu from the standpoint of the Torah. Um, and that means that Jews in a place like America should be measured in the kind of idealism that they express about what kind of a uh, safe and comfortable situation they sh should reasonably hope to have for themselves as long as the society uh, remains based on its historically central idols rather than on uh, the, the kind of relationship to a Kadosh Baruch that the Torah hopes for uh, from all of humanity. So I think I'll I'll stop the, the comments there and we can have a bit of a, a conversation, but that, those are the, the main points that I wanted to make. Is it possible that there's another somewhat similar way to look at um, anti-Semitism, specifically the murder of Jews, which ends up happening uh, over the course of Jewish history quite often. It's almost as though, as long as we're on, on some level, as long as we're not sacrificing lambs in the Beit HaMikdash, then we're gonna be sacrificed. So it's sort of like a dichotomy. Either, we're, either the world, we and the world, are going to be worship, worshiping Hashem and focused on, on Hashem. And it, as long as that's not happening, then the focal point is going to be not what it should be, the, 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 what's going on, what should be going on in the temple, but rather murdering the murder of Jews, which uh, symbolizes the attack on God, as opposed to worshiping God and attack on God. Yeah, so... Uh... I'd have to think a little bit more about how, how close the text comes to sort of stating that correspondence outright. I think it's a, a reasonable kind of midah, keneged midah that you're proposing. And certainly empirically and historically, there, there are examples that seem to support that kind of a trade-off. Um, I think maybe what it reminds me most of is the version of this that happens in Mitzrayim at the time when Bnei Israel are leaving, where the first Korban Pesach that they're doing, where they're slaughtering the lamb and painting the blood on their doors, corresponds to the moment of Makat Bechorot, when Akados Baruch who strikes the firstborn of Mitzrayim and the, the firstborn of Bnei Israel are spared. And I do think there's an element in there of Hashem saying, look, uh, obviously, it's not uh, for, for the, let's say, for the tender hearted, it is not a desirable or enjoyable thing to take something so innocent as a lamb and slaughter it. Um, but the point is that uh, Hakados Baruch Hu is, is saying if you're willing to do just a bit of this for me under the circumstances that I ask it of you and I command it as a way of showing your commitment to this covenant, then I can take care of the rest, so to speak. Like he can make arrangements for you know the the material security of his people um, that 
don't even, so to speak, require them to get their hands dirty. Like, B'nai's, this is not a story about how B'nai Israel rose up in violent rebellion and killed the firstborn of Egypt with their bare hands and then ran away. Akados Baruch Hu is the one who is striking the firstborn, and he's asking the people to focus on the avodah, on the, the korban, on, on the lamb. Um, and so I, I do think that in that instance, that trade-off that you're, you're pointing to certainly seems quite direct. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I think following on what I was saying before, you know, referring explicitly to, to America right at the end, and tying back to this sort of earlier discussion at the beginning of different kinds of ways people use the word antisemitism. So, like I said, I, th I think it's always a, it's always interesting to have it as a term because you sometimes are trying to point out that someone is like a paranoid delusional who 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 lives in a fantasy world and is you know driven to violence or hostility by these fantasies, and that is a a quite unique phenomenon that has to do with how people relate to the idea of Jews. But if you if you set that aside, um, increasingly in the present day, even on the lips of Jews in the U.S. who are talking about anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is, like I said before, treated as though it's a species of um, bigotry, and it, that, that that makes it a lever because if you can prove something is bigotry, then you can get the mob to swoop in and punish it and eliminate it. And so as a me mechanism for defending Jews, it's sort of like anything that threatens Jews, you want to prove that it's anti-Semitism because if, it can, if that can be definitively proven, then you suddenly have like a lot more support from the society for stamping it out. Um, and there's a, um, there, there's a significant problem with that. Well, there's several significant problems with that. Um, one of them is that it might be that there's hostility that, that carries a, a violent threat to it towards Jews, particularly in Israel, uh, as we know, where it's hard to convince people that it's really exactly the same thing as like racist bigotry, right? Like um, sometimes there are wars between countries and they, they, wars are not always about things that are identifiable as bigotry or racism. And also once wars are happening, everyone on one side of the war says bad things about people on the other side and vice versa. And that just becomes quite common. And so um, it's in the nature of, of war and conflict that uh, things like bigotry often kind of fall by the wayside and are hard to like tease out or identify. Uh, so are, so there definitely are people who make war against Israel, um, both at home and abroad, who it's, it's irrelevant whether it can be proven that they're doing so because of what something we call bigotry or, you know, whether there's nothing that you could call bigotry in why they're doing it, but they're still the enemies of Am Yisrael because they, they, they mean us harm and we have to fight them. And like and in that whole... Um, debate uh, in the context of trying to prove things that are bigotry to show that they're wrong, it becomes a very weak position for Jews trying to defend Am Yisrael to take uh, in that kind of an argument. And a much more confident one would just be to say, these are my people and those who mean harm to my people, you know, I should mean harm to them and I should try to stop them. Um, and uh, if, if you don't adopt a position with that kind of confidence, then you're going to uh, have a much less effective defense mounted in, in a political process that requires, you know, organizing people around uh, simple principles. Um, but the other thing I, I was going to say in a connection with that is that um, the the prime minister or the, the now perhaps, you know, the Prime Minister of, of the State of Israel, the current Prime Minister, but perhaps for a few more days, Yair Lapid even um, dabbled in exactly this kind of, of uh, talk about anti-Semitism, despite being the, the leader and, you know, 
commander in chief and um, chief executive of, of the state of Israel when he was the foreign minister. I mean, so he, he is all of those things now, but when he was the foreign minister in the previous government, um, or let's say in this current government, but when before he rotated, um, he made a statement uh, giving some speech about anti-Semitism that anti-Semitism, you know, the, the people who had um, thrown chain slaves into the ocean off of slave ships were also anti-Semites and also the uh, fanatical Tutsis who massacred Hutus in a, or Hutus who massacred Tutsis in, in Rwanda um, were also anti-Semites. He, he, he gave a speech where he by making those statements, was trying to rhetorically evoke the idea exactly that anti-Semitism should sort of, the, the Jewish aspect of that should fade into the background and we should unite the world in, in a struggle against all forms of racism and bigotry. And that position um, exactly uh, accomplishes a sort of evisceration of any confidence that um, Am Israel or Medinat Israel could have in, in, in working for it in its own interest to defend itself from animosities that are directed at it. Um, uh, because it's kind of trying to say that um, the, the hostility towards Jews is, is part of a larger global problem of all sorts of unjustified hostilities that needs to be solved at some kind of collective level. So it's it's obviously really uh, shameful and foolish for a leader of the state of Israel to be talking this way. Um, but it shows that the, 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 the way of <coughs> understanding hostility towards Jews um, that now is becoming more and more prevalent in the West by seeing it solely in these terms of like, it's only wrong if it's identifiable as bigotry, that ideological creep is coming to the doorstep of Israel itself and weakening the resolve of parts of um, the Israeli government to be willing to push back against uh, those who mean the state of Israel harm, whether they mean in harm for identifiably bigoted reasons or not. So I found this whole thing, it's a very fascinating issue here of um, the focus on anti-Semitism and how it's being defined. And that's on, the, on one level, there's a value to, I know that I, I remember that Sharansky, I believe, had a definition of uh, when being anti-Israel becomes anti-Semitic, uh, there's a, a whole bunch of criteria. One of it is perhaps disproportionately condemning Israel, uh, demonizing Israel, a few other criteria. And, and there might, there might, I'm not saying there's no, there's no value to pointing out uh, how the anti-Israel attitudes that are out there are, are really based on anti-Semitism. But at the same time, I think you make a powerful point that all this focus on anti-Semitism as being a type of bigotry, but but sort of leaving it open that, basically opening the door to a situation where many liberal leaning Jews in America, for example, will have soaked this, this doctrine of being against anti-Semitism, against bigotry, against anti-Semitism, but, but, but in such a manner that if Israel will be identified as a totalitarian country at some point, by the mainstream in the same way that Russia or China or North Korea would be, then the Jews would suddenly sort of have to surrender and say, well, what are we going to do? Yeah, not even, that, not even like something as ex extreme as what, you know, you say totalitarian. It's more that um, once you say that the way you decide whether you support something is if someone has accused it of bigotry, um, you, you can easily drive a wedge between state of Israel and 
um, Jews who supposedly oppose anti-Semitism by just trying to convince them that Israel is now guilty of bigotry. And that that has really been going on for decades, right? That goes back to the Zionism is racism, a UN resolution in the 1970s. Um, that was part of a, a KGB-led effort to develop a propaganda campaign that uh, turned the sort of um, liberal appeal of the state of Israel on itself by uh, finding a way of characterizing Israel as a demon by those same standards. <clears throat> and I think the point is that, um, to a large degree, Jews of the 20th century kind of opened themselves to that attack because the the line at the time, like in the 1960s and 1970s, about Israel, whether coming from Israel or from American Jews who supported Israel, was not this is or it was not usually or predominantly this is um a unique situation because we're a unique people we've been given a unique mission by the creator of the world and we need this one unique patch of land in order to fulfill that mission and you know we're sorry for any inconvenience that causes but we have to do things a certain way um and so we hope you'll help us and if you try to stop us then uh you may find that we'll stop being nice to you you know, that, that wasn't the, the story. The story was about the recent uh, millions who perished in the Shoah and how terrible that was and the need for a place, a, a safe haven for refugees from persecution. Um, and that the society that was being created was a very egalitarian society and a very democratic society. And so there was a whole kind of package constructed to, to say this is now... A, a fully justified project uh, that, that deserves 100% of the support of um, all Jews because they are liberal and not because they are Jews. Uh, and, and that has ultimately led to a much uglier and more complicated propaganda situation where we're constantly fighting off attacks that we've essentially invited by not making the right kind of case or explanation for what we're doing here. In a sense, the pro-democratic defense of Israel, the whole there's an idol, the idol of democracy taken to a unreasonable extreme. Just like any like we were talking before, anything can be taken to be an idol, whether it's equality, liberty, democracy, any many different things can be taken to an extreme. And American Jews and others. <coughs> many, I should say, many American Jews and others have created such an idol out of extreme democracy and extreme egalitarianism, an extreme focus on being against bigotry that it basically is a big setup. It's a setup for a big fall. Like you're, I think that's what you're trying to say. It's a, it's a setup for a fall. We're going to, we're ultimately, the state of Israel is going to be in for a fall because all these expectations have been raised according to these extreme criteria. And when Israel, for whatever the reason, isn't able any longer to survive because they'll need to do whatever they'll need to do with regards to their enemies. And, and when that stage comes, then the, we're going to be in for a fall. And then uh, you'll see a lot of uh, certain types of American Jews going along with our enemies and saying, hey, Israel, just like... Uh, or a host of other um, non-democratic regimes. Yeah, um, no, I think I think that's true, and it's it has um, it, it, it's an, an understandable development in one sense because it, it's it's an outgrowth of the fact that um, you know, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, a country here that now uh, is well underway, you know, being uh, built by all the members of Amisa who've returned from all around the world in the last few centuries. But um, a whole lot of people came in partly with idealisms that were imported from um, and set to the standards of, of these other societies that they came from and 
Um, as a result, there was always this need to kind of explain or justify what was happening in those terms. And some people do that very well. You know, BB are about to become prime minister again, prime minister, um, has been doing a lot of touring around talking about his recent book and giving interviews. And he makes these beautiful arguments about, you know, the why the state of Israel should exist that are that attempt to appeal to the assumed person who's sort of listening, sitting somewhere in, in the US or in Europe, <clears throat> and trying to kind of anticipate their standards and criteria of judgment um, and, and make the case in those terms and sort of say, well, there wasn't really anyone here you know, 150 years ago and Jews decided to come back and started developing the place and then a whole bunch of other people moved in as well. And I, you know, there's plenty of truth to that. And in one sense, that history needs to be needs to be told. But in another sense, the Torah itself tells us that there were Kananim here before Bnei Yisrael came. And and so the idea that there are some people here, um, and then that that means that Am Yisrael don't have license to pursue the project designed for us in the Torah because of that. That doesn't really fly according to the standards of the Torah. It, and the Torah never sweeps these kinds of things under the rug. It doesn't tell some story about once there was a beautiful land that was completely empty of people. And it was made so by Hashem so that Am Yisrael could come and dwell in it. And when they arrived, they were the first people there. And, and you know, it's not some kind of um, self-congratulatory myth. It says, no, there are a whole bunch of other people here and there were some of them were even kind of nice, and so you know Abraham is told that the the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet in its fullness, and so he has to kind of wait for his descendants to occupy the land, um, and and so eventually it became the case that Akadosh Baruch Hu was ready to let Bnei Yisrael come to the land, but it took some time, <coughs> and um, that. That is the, the lesson that we're, we're meant to actually be carrying with us. Is like, okay, maybe it is conveniently true that there weren't that many people here 150 years ago, but so what if there were? Um, that wouldn't, in principle, eliminate the, the obligation of Am Yisrael to try to, to return to the land and, and live in a society according to the Torah. Um, and so sometimes they're, they're in. You know, to say Bibi is well-meaning is complicated because he's a very crafty person, and he has many intentions in what he says. Um, but I, I think he he exhibits a lot of um, affection and, and motivation for trying to save Am Yisrael uh, and, and do the best that he sees for Am Yisrael. But he thinks that he needs a lot of power in order to do that. Um, and so, like many people who've sought power historically. Um, he kind of sincerely believes that the only way of of doing the good that he needs to do is for him to get a lot of power, um, <laughs> which is a double-edged sword. But I digress. I think the point is that he is very eloquent and knowledgeable and can make these kinds of arguments, and maybe they are persuasive to some people, and maybe there is even is some purpose that's served in that. But the fundamental argument can't be that we should be in the land um, only because of the sort of contingent happenstance of recent history that um, makes a kind of sentimentally appealing case or a case that happens to comport with what certain Western philosophers might say about, you know, uh, who gets what right to what land. Um, that's not actually how we justify it. And I think a related point is that it's it's very often said when people try to say that something is kind of anti-Semitic in how people deal with the state of Israel, um, that they say, well, the way you tell is you, you look for double standards, right? That um, there are things that no one expects of any other country in the world, but they expect it of Israel and they, um, they get really uh, animated when Israel sort of fails to meet that standard. And so that's anti-Semitism. Um, and, and that prejudice and like the proof that it results from some kind of prejudice or unfairness or non-equivalence or inequality in terms of how we're being 
regarded or treated, that's what means, you know, what proves that it's wrong. What again is kind of upside down about that is that the Jewish self-conception since time immemorial uh, is that we are this Am Segula, right? We are a nation with a, a unique relationship to a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and that doesn't make us better than other people, or it doesn't make us greater. It, it formally gives us a different status in Kiddusha and a different set of obligations and responsibilities. Um, and uh, but, but it does mean that we are non-equivalent in our own self-definition, according to the Torah. Um, in the same way that you could say um, the parties to a contract can be non-equivalent in their different obligations and what they're required to provide, you know, as, as part of some agreement, um, they can be um, <coughs> uh, defined differently and, and then different things are expected of them. Um, and this is kind of common in a matter of, of, of law when it's a, a, an agreement between parties. So like those people who wants to make um, his agreement and, and his covenant in such a way that I mean, I'll have a, a separate status and have a, a different set of jobs. And once that's the case, and once we accept that on ourselves and regard ourselves this way, to then turn around and say, why is the world treating us different than, than other nations? Like, why are we not being held to exactly the same standard? Like, that rhetoric is Western Enlightenment rhetoric. That rhetoric is saying, everyone or everything is come has somehow equal or equivalent behind some veil of ignorance before some kind of decision gets made. And, and we're, we're kind of appealing implicitly to like, let Immanuel Kant be the judge. Um, we should be treated just like Liechtenstein or just like Cambodia um, and held to the same standard. And instead somehow the world is treating us different and we're shocked, shocked that that's the case. It's it's very strange because on the other hand, if we're actually looking in the Torah, it's kind of our job to uh, act and advertise um, like we regard ourselves as having a separate definition with different obligations and responsibilities. So I'm I'm not saying on the one hand that therefore I agree with all of the the ridiculous uh, accusations that are lodged against Israel. Because it is often obviously absurd when I don't know the New York Times or Al Jazeera or whatever uh, turn a blind eye to the actions of you know a dozen other countries doing lots of um, terrible things with their military or whatever, and then they take one or another thing that Israel does and, and try to make a big thing about it. But the point is, the answer to that is not just to cry foul and say no, we just want to be regarded as exactly the same. Um, because the Torah is not actually advising us <laughs> to adopt that approach, um, but rather is saying um, we should be uh, studying the Torah in order to understand it, in order to teach the world about Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and 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 to say if others come to try to sort of scold or or lecture us, that we can gently recommend that they consider that. From our perspective, it's it's supposed to run the other way that you know uh, we have things to teach them about Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and that's our job. Um, and we will learn from our Torah and from Hashem about what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. But we're not trying to learn morality or, or right and wrong from societies that set their standards by idols, and and that's. Uh, Pure and simple, uh, how, how the Torah is, is instructing us. Thank you very much, Dr. Englund. My pleasure. And uh, Chanukah Sameach. Chanukah Sameach.